Welcome. It's Anna, Rock Dance Theater here, checking in back. I wanted to say Thursday, but no, it's Sunday, and it's a very special Sunday, guys. Welcome to the Wastelands, because today our episode is going to be pretty much focused about a very contemporary way around the post-apocalypse, and what, whatever you might think about it, you cannot imagine. My special guest today is Mark Cordery himself. Um, if you guys are familiar a little bit with the Mad Max movies, with um, a cover of Iron Maiden, with a character that hit the whole planet with his image and has been recreated and been on stage ever since 1991. That's only one small story that might hit a bell. But um, basically, guys, this is uh, one of the post-apocalyptic live virtual stage series. Welcome, everybody. Whoever is checking in with us today, hit the subscribe button, number one. You know the drill. I'm going to keep repeating that, so you might as well do it. And uh, yeah, let's Let's enjoy the show, guys. Um, if you have been familiar within the last seasons uh, or two with Rock Dance Theater Project, you probably might have noticed uh, a little bit of a twist in the styling. It has gone a little bit more hardcore, painted faces, bony skulls, you know, all kinds of weird stuff that have been disrupted, uh, dismembered, and uh, pretty much their function has been flipped around and literally taken out of a Mad Max movie. So. Uh, we're going to talk about one of these little things with my special guest today. And you know what? I don't want to keep you, huh, I always want to keep you a little bit interested. But you know what? Let's invite our special guest for today, Mike Cordery. Mark Cordery. See, I changed his name multiple times. I'll actually ask him on air, how the hell do I, uh, do I spell his name? <laughs> and I already see he's laughing at me backstage in the green room, which is what I love, guys. This is unscripted, this is reality TV, and this is raw on a Sunday. So heads up, everybody, Mark Cordery himself. Hi, Anna. Um, yeah, <laughs> whatever you want, I don't care, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Hi, Bob. <laughs> I cannot I'm believe I did it again, but you know what? There is a reason. I, I'm going to tell you a story later. Hi, how are you? Thank you for joining today. Oh, thank you for the invite. I'm uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. Rock Dance Theater show went post up. You know what? When you did tell me stuff is going to be the main topic for today, not only I like stuff. It's <laughs> like <laughs> the complexity of it. I think it's super super exciting uh not to hang there bored you know and without gadgets and toys surround it it's literally i think we have we have a, a kid personality within the performing arts i don't know what's what's your take on that we cannot be adults really right yeah i, I think um i think you don't want to grow up too much if you're into art uh or into performing arts i think you've got to have that that sort of enthusiasm of youth you don't want to be old and cynical in in the yeah. art community or especially in performance um so yeah i think you i think you've got to be you've got to be young at heart i, I like to think that you don't stop playing because you get old you get old because you stop playing um, oh yeah absolutely I couldn't agree more. You know what? That's exactly why I get, sometimes I get so overly excited, like I got tongue tied or whatever. It's just like I go hyper because that's how excited and passionate about I'm, I'm about this stuff. So it's like, you know what? It's all authentic. It's, it proves how we are into the things that we, that we both actually do. And, you know, one of the things that I, that I really wanted to um, also kind of hit on within, within your work um, a, a little while back, not only in the performing arts business, um, I did, I think it was during an interview or just like a talk, I did throw out words that that said and described, you know what, it's pretty ugly, a category in itself. And I think your work, not only is it outstanding, but it does hit on a completely new quality um, in, well, in the visual arts, in the performing arts. Um, would you agree on that kind of definition? Like pretty ugly because it's pretty you know certainly there's stuff that i make which i think would quite easily be described as that especially my creepy doll stuff um <clears throat> i mean i've i've kind of ended up doing a a whole range of like gas masks and and weird dolls made out of old barbie dolls or children's discarded toys and those kind of went down quite a macabre route, but 
a lot of people still love them. I went to workshops for them, showing people how to make them. I mean, uh, where have we got them? I've got, I mean, this is more. Sure, if we, if we got a dolly, let's make it as well showcase. Yeah, uh, this is Day of the Dead. Um, doll. And she's one of the prettier ones. Uh, uh, the other ones, the masks and stuff, I, I end up making really weird stuff. Well, th this really is uh, very close to the uh, Mexican symbolism, actually, right? Because those folks over there, they really embrace death and they like they celebrate it as any kind of other party. It's it's it has hardly any time to do with with sadness, you know, with grief on that level. It's literally a, a part of life, and they they shout that very much out. Yeah. Why this Why this doll? Actually, I gotta admit that I have not seen this one and I'm familiar with your work for quite a little bit of time already. Um, which season or year is that from? The, the doll? Um, yeah, the, the I made, <clears throat> I, I played around with a, a selection of uh, Day of the Dead style dolls mm, towards the end of last year. Uh, I think because we had been in San Diego uh, when we were heading to Wasteland Weekend. Okay. And we went to uh, an excellent taco bar in San Diego, and it was just all Day of the Dead themed. And we were just sitting there going like, yeah, this is giving me lots of ideas. So I just kind of like the color of it. It's that mixture of macabre, but a real joyous macabre. Yeah. Um, and the color and just, yeah, just the style of it just clicked something and went, yeah, I should play with that. So. You know what? I'm smiling. You said San Diego. This is actually like my my childhood uh, hometown. You know, I was yeah. born in Poland, but I was raised in California, San Diego. So like, you know, I, all of a sudden I, I get this image is like Loyola, you know, Boulevard and Drive. And it's like oh, we yeah. also had, well, all of the celebrations, you know, you, you pass Easter and Christmas. And of course, there is no snow. There is no this, no that. But California is pretty much, you know, a Hispanic state. So we, we did have that. And I do remember as a kid, all of these like masks and skulls hanging around in banks, you know, in malls. It was awesome, you know, and me being a small kid, three, four, five years old, I was like, hey, I dig this. This is fun. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 we've been to California and driven through like Mojave Desert and the Joshua Tree and all of that for the past two years. Uh, yeah. And Love it, absolutely love it. I mean, it's, yeah, you were saying a lot of the like the Spanish influence, and the Mexican influence, and the architecture, and the food and the culture there. It's wonderful. I mean, it's awesome. It's everything that embraces life. I think, right? It's just yeah. the joy of it. Yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah, I mean, Halloween there. I mean, if you're mixing <laughs> all of that with Halloween, which is God, they start Halloween really early. So we were there in September, and places like Walmart have already got like three aisles full of Halloween stuff. And I'm just going like, oh, bag of those, bag of those skulls. Exactly. <laughs> chuck it in the shopping trolley. My wife's going, why are you getting this? How are we going to get it home? I need this. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> It's quite interesting that your wife kind of still asks because she's been probably around multiple projects, even the ones that are literally handmade. So it's not like it's a secret you being hunkered down in your in your bunker, you know, and, and working and crafting. It's like for sure she she did see actual bone in there being produced. She is kind of used to me now. I mean this <clears throat> sorry, that shoulder. Uh behind yeah, me. It's, it's, it's in reverse. Yeah, that's her costume from last year. Uh, at Wasteland Weekend, so she is kind of used, you know, used to the whole thing, and uh, yeah, pretty blasé about it. But still, <laughs> you know, if you're picking up a load of bags of skulls and t-shirts and stuff from uh, Walmart while you're meant to be stocking up for food, then questions are still asked. It is essentials, you know, if you need it, you need it. I have multiple weird objects on my desk actually, and I do need them all, you know, I because we did we did have a funny little chat, not only before our sound check uh, here in this live show, but also like I think a week ago or so. Um, and we were actually, you know, discussing all kinds of, well, not only creative arts, but stuff. But today we touched on a, on a little element that, that are accessories. Um, if we could call them, basically. I think your docking system for any digital equipment is way cooler than mine. Mine is not 
not indoors, it's a JBL, you know, it's red, that's a cool thing, but it's quite lame compared to yours. <laughs> I think it's the one that is actually glowing right behind you, you know, and it's a secret, ladies and gentlemen, it, it stopped being a secret. Let's see what, what Mark has over here. This is my eye dock. So an iPod slits in the back of it, and the two filters are speakers. Um, I don't know why I made it, but I just, it seemed like a good idea at the time, and now it just sits gathering dust in my workshop. So there That's you go. That's awesome. I love this. Everybody uh, that is just checking in and is, is listening uh, only on Spotify and on Anchor and cannot actually see it, guys, I have good news for you. This Rock Dance Theater special live stream with Mark Cordery himself. See, I said it right. <laughs> is going to go into a rebroadcast premiere soon enough. So we're going to have all of the awesome uh, details, the videos, the artwork, so you can enjoy and check that out in detail. This one is a pretty cool one. When did you have this one made? Um, maybe the home lockdown uh, time? Lock. Is that, reason? Uh, that was, oh, I don't know, when did I make that? Three years ago, maybe? Uh, so just what, ideas occur and you just go, Oh, that would be a nice thing to make. So if I've got time in between commission jobs, which is what most of my work is, it's commissions because this is my full-time job. Yeah. But when I get a bit of downtime, I've got a kind of a, a backlog of fun things I'd like to try out. So that was one of them. Um, yeah, I've, I've got I've, – I think as with any artist, if, you, if you're making a living off your art – there's always your secret diary full of things that you want to make just for yourself, not not as a commission, not for anybody yeah, else. Yeah. Or <clears throat> you get you get the opportunity to try and direct a client in a particular in a bucket. Because this bucket yeah. is kind of interesting to, yeah, to yeah. dig out of. Yeah. And I've, I've done that with with my current build. I won't say what the theme is, but it's something I really wanted to make. And then this commission came up. It's for Wasteland Weekend again. I did a lot of work for Wasteland. Mm -hmm. By uh, the way, guys, if any of you viewers don't know what Wasteland Weekend is, sorry to interrupt, Mark, is it's actually one of the biggest Wasteland slash post-apocalyptic community arts events uh, event out there in the in the world. Um, actually, in the United States. So um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, again, I've, I've sort of suggested an idea that I wanted to do for a client that gave me a job, and thankfully the client's gone, oh, yeah, I like that. So I'm sort of gently suggesting things, but I think all artists will do that. Um, and it's nice that a client will trust you to, to do that, but I guess if they're coming to a particular artist, whether it's me or anybody else, they're going to that artist because they like their style. So. Yeah. You know. they, they know what they're looking for. I mean, it's it's usually, as you say, if it's commission work, it's actually a client that, that is aware and they usually know what they want. And throughout years of, of your history, I think it has been kind of the case, of course, as you build up kind of from day one and get recognized and get noticed and you establish a specific style that even if you see a photo of, of or a recording of one of your project costumes, props, you kind of know it's Cordery's work, right? <laughs> it's like not, not someone else's. And it is cool, I find, that that defines, like, for me, to be honest, uh, as a performing artist, which is <coughs> most of the stuff that I actually do, I do not produce and create, although actually fashion and styling has been a huge element also in my pieces and my shows since day one, ever since I was 11. And funny enough, the very first piece I did was post-apocalyptic on a very light motive, because I remember I had dreadlocks back then, up until the waist. I was banded up with, with the oldest, most rusty and grimy bandages I could find at home, and then the rest we kind of painted. My right. friend from school literally threw a bucket over me, you know, dripping with water, and I was actually portraying a, a creature that I think like fell into a well and got, you know, turned into a zombie pretty much. And that was the piece, you know, and it wasn't Japanese Buto style. So there no. you go. Um, but I think like, yeah, coming to back to that notion, it's exactly one of these things that your style kind of defines your work. And it's, it's also in music. If you do hear something, then you could kind of tell, okay, this is exactly this bass player, or this is exactly this guitar player without even knowing, but hearing it, you, you know who the person is behind the work. So. But I think that's, that's, 
that's really important though as a creator as an artist <clears throat> is trying to define your own style i mean yeah especially within the post apocalyptic genre there are a lot of people you know crafting hobby crafting or part time crafting or making their own costumes or occasionally taking commissions for for other things um there are very few full time crafters but there are there are some that's true but i think it i think it's just really important that you don't start looking like everybody else mm. but that you're not trying to i don't know how to describe it that you're not steal or copy or just reproduce you're not going too far outside the genre that your kit can fit in with everybody else's kit at somewhere like Wasteland Weekend or yeah. or Old Town or whatever but that still within that genre you've created something that's distinctively yours and as you say for music as well that you just don't want to sound like every other guitarist or or every other singer that it's it's that this really important moment where you go like, okay, yeah, this is my style. This is my style. This is me, hundred percent. And uh, uh, so, and that, I do try to do that. I mean, I, I try not to be too influenced by other crafters because I don't want to start looking like somebody else. I want to start keep looking like me. I think that's the best thing. And while I'm why I'm smiling again, well, number one, I'm super happy to have you on my show because it's it's awesome. I do appreciate your work for for a really long time. And even for everybody uh, watching us right now, guys, we me and Mark, we have not collaborated yet. This is actually our first like virtual collab slash coffee hangout, whatever you name it. But um, uh, yeah, I think what you touched on uh, ever the slightest and actually, well, answered my, one of my questions before I actually wanted to to dig into that topic is because um, it's, I would say the post-apocalyptic genre or, or style or world, I don't know even what it is because it is kind of not only a lifestyle, it is a certain field of work that is quite alternative and quite avant-garde. Mm. Um, and it, it cross pollinates throughout not only the music world, the, the movie world, um, TV, uh, visual arts themselves and, uh, and also event which is in in themselves like guys the festivals we that we mentioned like West Wasteland Weekend, Old Town, uh, Luna Negra, Fresh New uh, Unknown uh, Festival in, in Spain, a um, couple Wish of others that that are uh, that are skipping my mind right now I'm hitting a blank uh, but I'm just bad with names. Um, yeah, all of all of these kind of mingle artists such as yourself, let's say, on the design level, on the performance level. And it is, I think, not not easy to to keep that originality originality because there's so many ways to go about specifically doing post-apocalyptic, let's say, clothing and costumes. Mm -hmm. What would you say that that well, I know and I could kind of name it because I'm outside the picture, I judge judge that and and kind of observe that from the outside. You might be a little bit biased because you are the maker, you're the creator, but what would you say that defines your work? Is that a specific play with colors or specific play with textures or the materials that you use? I know you've used a lot over 30 years of your career, uh, which we will kind of stop and pause on certain eras. But um, if, if, you, if you could kind of hashtag that, Mark Cordery, you know, what, what comes after that for you? Um, well, I get a lot, a lot of questions and inquiries about how to reproduce the particular finish that mm -hmm. I've got in a lot of my pieces, yeah. which is, is, again, one of those things I want to try and keep to myself because it is a distinctive it's trade. a trade it's a trade secret yeah it's it all ties in with that trying to look different to everybody else so i think i've i think i've got a pretty good finish for uh for my pieces or you know a, a different finish to a lot of other people's yeah. um i mean the dolls kind of ran away with with me and for quite a while i was like oh mark who's the guy who does that weird shit with dolls yeah 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 yeah. the frankenstein dolls <laughs> yeah it was, I, literally that whole thing stemmed from me going to a car boot sales flea market in a car park one sunday and somebody was just had 
an old doll there, and it was labelled Ugly Doll, two pound. Oh, uh, there you go. And that really is quite an ugly doll. <laughs> so I'll give you a quid for that. Soon. Hence the name. And and I I thought that actually that could that would be really spooky if you made it took the face and just made it into a mask. So I did that, and somebody went, "Oh, I have that." And then I thought, yeah, that was actually quite fun. So I got a few more. And then suddenly I was getting loads and loads and loads of orders for like a creepy doll mask, another creepy doll mask. I was thinking, yeah, okay, I think I've done enough. I was now, I think I, I, I think I've like heard something. Being the guy who does the creepy doll masks. <laughs> um, so I managed to slow down on those. But there was, I'm still making them, I'm still getting orders. I've got a couple of my books at the moment for for creepy doll masks but awesome yeah so that that was a period which which was fine but i'd like to not just be known for those just not to stick on that yeah because your work mark for all of our viewers that that are just discovering uh not only the post-apocalyptic world what wasteland is and why the hell are we talking in the first place um dolls and props have have been appearing throughout world history basically within movies spe specifically and also series and all kinds of music videos from early early in the in the age i remember also and as a kid watching tales from the script actually when i was when i was still living uh over over in the united states and i loved it you know like each time the host you know, the dead body going out of the coffin, you know, having that maniacal laugh and, you know, being so skinny and everything is like basically ripping off him, yeah, the, the artificial flesh and all. It's like stuff like that have been such an imprint in culture. Same for the dolls, I think, you know, you, every now and then you did see that, let's say in an Ozzy Osbourne show, right? Um, yeah, well, back in the day. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, things which shouldn't be alive, but are acting, you know, that do come alive. That, that whole Very much alive. <clears throat> animated, inanimate creature. I thought. I think that's yeah. That's something which just runs through human nature. Is yeah. that not be walking towards me? Uh, <laughs> make it stop. I think that's yeah. something which has been in in like the human zeitgeist for as long as we've had a zeitgeist. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm a huge horror fan. Have Have you been a horror fan, like, early oh, on, let's say? Absolutely. I, when I was a kid... I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> used to, they used to do the Friday night double horror feature on one of the TV channels, back when we only had three TV channels. This is in the 70s. And For all um, of you kids. Mm -hmm. Sorry? For all of the kids that don't remember, there used to be a TV set and just... Three channels, not three thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we are yeah. that old. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, there was a the late night Friday night double creature feature, and that would have your 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 old classics, the Universal, you know, Creature from the Black Lagoon, the Mummy, the Werewolf, and then you would have the the old Hammer horror films, Dracula and you know, Frankenstein Lives, and all of those. And I was constantly being caught sat on the stairs peering through the uh, through the crack in the door watching them when i should have been asleep as a kid and eventually my parents relent and go okay you can stay up and watch one of them but from, from just from really really early days that whole fascination in monsters and horror um and it was very tame by today's standards in terms of horror oh yeah no question about it like today Many it's it's out of out of whack pretty much like the amount of yeah, blood yes. and gore and just guts exploding it's uh, there's genres of horror which just leave me cold it's like uh, i'm not interested in that but a good psychological horror spooky something that's spooky something that's only hinted at or glimpsed is equally as as horrific and scary and probably more so than having somebody's guts ripped open exactly because it's because it's not so direct it's not so obvious right and psychologically it kind of tortures you because it's it's a very fair amount of light usually it's mostly psychologically like uncomfortable like i remember a couple of years ago you probably know the movie um the descent bunch yes. of girls are being yes. taken into um uh an unknown cave system and it turns out they're you know well guys basically watch it there is not much to this movie yet 
oh my God, I remember I was watching it alone, living in Linz in my small little room that I rented out at the time. And I watched it in pitch black, which was a bad idea, number one. So then I, I literally remember <clears throat> walking to the toilet after watching the movie. I was, I was freaking out. It's, it's just all of these creatures for sure were clouding up on me. It's just like, it was great. It was awesome. You only a glimpse of them, didn't you? They, they were just hinted at. You, you catch a bit in a talk, right, and that was it. But yeah. um, one of the classic ones for that is Alien, the first Alien film. Absolutely. My, my favorite as well. Oh, it's, it's still, still one of my favorite. But because the design itself was not really truly seen until the glimpse right at the very end, and it had such a confusing and unique silhouette to it, when you ever caught a glimpse of part of it, you're just like trying to piece this creature together and you, you really couldn't. And yeah. that, although it was a beautiful, still is a beautifully classic design, and I think Giga's work is just, just unique. It's outstanding. It's outstanding. I mean, the, the, the profile, right? Like yeah. of, of him dr like dripping like the, the gel or whatever that substance was, you know. Um, it's, Mimicking saliva or stuff. It's the perfect organism. Um, yeah. But because you did, you had such a unique shape to the creature and you only really caught it in glimpses, your mind was still trying to piece it all together. It wasn't a man in a suit. It was exactly. something that you, you really you only caught a glimpse of. And that <clears throat> that thing which works in your mind I think is more effective than what you can ever put fully on screen. Uh, mm. One of my, my all time favorite films, which again is something that I, I found as watched as a kid is an old black and white film called the haunting. And they did yeah. a hideous remake of it, but the haunting is possibly the most perfect scary film and you never see a thing. Everything is done with sounds, with good camera work, with good yeah, the angling, editing, mm -hmm. as you say, exactly. The, the yeah. rest is up to the imagination, pretty much. And I always found that um, interesting within within a live performance period that you kind of within a time frame, let's say a performance or a movie or whatever, a screening is sixty minutes or ninety minutes. Yet you do play in a specific way with the build up, right? With with emotions, with the reactions, and you kind of don't give everything away because it's like the fun is gone. You know that that the viewer can actually appreciate and build their own story, like fill up with with their own either emotions, memories, um, connotations, and it's so individual always. And you know what? It's it's always fascinating, always to me, how people interpret art number one and it's like i'm not talking really about um preconceptions necessarily because i hate labels you know i hate naming th stuff and putting them into categories it's just like you know what what what's the point the beauty of it is is not to be able to name it that it's so not defined and for me post-apocalyptic art art generally is undefined it's not a genre for me it's not a style because number one it's so broad as you say there's so many crafters that just do it kind of as a hobby, as a side, you know, they like to have fun with it. But for people sure. like yourself um, that are actually professionals in the business, and then you can actually see that on screen in professional photo shoots um, and so on and so forth, it's exactly one of one of these things that it's so broad that it's not either dolls, it's not only costumes, and it's not only props that you can just kind of, you know, see it in a gallery. But um, coming back to Alien, uh, if you if you did Alien, um actually handmade what what would your version be would it be far off oh what if you so, got a chance to kind of do alien part 17 you know go for it i, I just don't think you can beat the original design i mean they've <laughs> they've riffed off it's it perfect well, no, it, it is i think it i think it is the perfect design because at the time it was utterly unique <clears throat> that we'd never seen anything like it on screen. And um, a lot of people love the sequel, Aliens. But for me, I was kind of, I was disappointed that Cameron didn't go back to Giga and use his designs. He got people to basically do something which looked like Giga. Mm. I think that was kind of a, I think that was almost insulting because I would love to have seen what Giga himself would have created 
as the Alien Queen, for example. Yeah. Just that man's mind was unique. And I think it's a shame that basically Cameron decided to just maybe plagiarize is a strong word, but just take. You know what? I haven't seen it. Time. You're not going to believe. I haven't watched it, but I think if, if you say he hasn't reached out to him, in my mind, I would probably have a similar reaction to yours. It's because that's the mothership, you know, that's kind of the base and the foundation for that. And I would imagine that even out of respect, you kind of, you know, mention that and you really go back to the founder. But I guess we cannot speak for him. But I think it was, I don't know, I don't know whether there was a falling out between Cameron and Giga or I know Giga wasn't exactly the most easy person to work with, but he was passionate. He was, a, you know, mm. really driven and unique artist and sometimes passionate artists aren't necessarily easy to work with <laughs> no um, so yeah but i think you were saying what how would i redesign it i wouldn't i, I would just that's his well, vision that's not necessarily his. let me rephrase maybe not necessarily redesigned it but if you did have a theme and i'm slowly like Jumping over to my next question, which is a huge, basically a huge topic, and we could talk on for hours, but let's say if you did have a post-apocalyptic theme, Alien, which not only this year, 2020, um, came up kind of officially in the media, um, not that it's like a secret and, and all like ancient civilizations and stuff, but if you did, did have a take on, on Alien, what would that be? Would it be a doll direction would that be like a mask oriented collection or i think i've got an answer Hang on. all right <laughs> it's it's kind of to do with with lines and profiles okay this, this is my helmet from uh from wasteland weekend and there's a lot of pipe work, which is definitely inspired by Giga's work. If you look at Alien, a lot of his, his texturing is this conduit, the corrugated conduit. But this line, this extended curve, I would say is, is definitely inspired by Giga's lines. Because it's, mm. that, it's that Art Nouveau extended curve, a very elegant, long line. Yeah. Like a prolonged kind of profile, right? Like forehead and and, and, and pipes do. You know, you've got that that long curve which you've got of the alien head. So I, I, I would say actually, there's a bit of Giga's, you know, influence <laughs> in this. Influence in there. That's really beautiful. If we if we had to break that down a little bit more, could you explain to our viewers what is it actually that we're seeing? Like me personally, I, I do know how a, a wasteland workshop looks like because I, I do work with fashion designers like that and it's all kinds of materials. But could you describe a little bit how much metal, plastic, organic matter uh, is in, in there? There is very little metal in it. The This peak here is from uh, a dirt bike helmet. Um, the harness that it's all attached to is just an adjustable harness from inside a plastic welding mask. So there's not actually any helmet involved in here because this was going to be worn in the Mojave Desert. So <laughs> Plus the temperature, oh, right? It has to be functional. Yeah. Um, uh, resin cat skull, uh, various bits and pieces, pipes and, and containers and stuff. Uh, the mask is leather. Um, scratch built from leather with just various bits of plastic. I mean, this bit here is actually the nozzle from uh, a garden hose, just uh -huh. nozzle. Um, these are uh, old asthma inhaler canisters. Uh, the spring load because they are quite uh, prominent, and I figured I do a lot of lab as well. I've actually role play, and if you're wearing something like this and it gets hit. You it usually gets destroyed. Yeah. Well, it'll either it'll either break or it'll catch and drag your face off. Um, <laughs> so spring loaded. Um, so yeah, leather, plastic, um, a little bit of aluminium in there, um, and the goggles are just some um, aluminium welding goggles that I got off Amazon. So it's awesome. it's just bits. It's all about shapes. It's all yeah. about finding the right shapes and just playing with them until they work together. And that, that's kind of my process of working is very much an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'll have an idea. I knew I wanted this sort of line. I knew I was going to use this peak. Um, but everything and also, <clears throat> would you say that then if you, let's say, do you have an inspiration for that shape? Okay, I know it's going to be a mask. These are going to be the elements. Do you also know prehand the, the colors and the, the shading of the specific mask, let's say? Or does that kind of unwind as you go? No, I, th I think I'll, I'll just put them down because he's not sure. <laughs> it's going to be a workout. <laughs> we don't have an assistant for the time being, but next next time, next episodes, guys, we promise that we're going to have a rock dance theater assistant for Mark that can you know present all of that. Right. Or maybe I, I will try to kind of My delight was screen. <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, what were you saying? Oh yeah, um, sure. about the colors and uh, sticking to the I, I mean, to the fading of that. Yeah, I, th I think on the whole, your post-apocalyptic color palette is is fairly limited. There's you know, there's a lot of browns and a lot of you know sort of military greens and blacks and occasional splash of color, but that generally comes from I think a, a lot of military webbing and stuff being used. A lot of ex-military clothing and stuff gets used. Yeah. So those colours, those colours tend to be a natural, a natural fit with a grimy, dirty, grubby, desolate post-apocalyptic world. Um, but I think it's nice to try and play with different colour palettes sometimes. I mean, this this costume here was. So let's maybe present that to the viewers, guys. Let's let's make a nice zoom on that so that Mark can present that. As you said, um, your your lovely wife was actually wearing that very one in Wasteland Weekend. Um, so for me, this was I wanted to do something which felt like it was it lived in the desert because again, it was going to be for the Mojave Desert. So I wanted these these more desert colors. And the, the main body of it is uh, old US uh, mail sacks. So, and they mm -hmm. old, they're already grubby. I virtually had to do nothing to them. Yeah, it's, it's a good start. If you want to dis dismember and just like destroy fabric, it's, it's a good base, right? Yeah. So I, I wanted something which was light in tones for starters. So it wasn't all the dirty browns and the blacks and the, you know, the greens. It wasn't drab colours, it was something which was a lighter a lighter costume, lighter in tone and, and lighter in weight. Um, and all these mesh, all these orange sections here, uh, these are all mesh so that, again, to be worn in the desert, trying not to kill my wife with heat, exhausting. <laughs> That's very nice of you, you know, like that the, the actual designer does think that the, the model, the performer is comfortable, you know, because you know what, I've, I've worked with artists that so don't care, you know, it looks cool. Yeah. And the actual idea of it, that is supposed to be uncomfortable, you know. You have to factor in practicality for costume as well. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's fine to just like, I look awesome. But <laughs> if, if you, your shoulders are breaking, and you're, you know, you're suffering from heat exhaustion and dehydration, <clears throat> and everything hurts after half an hour. Then that's not necessarily a great costume. Um, you you have to you have to make things practical. I mean, the, this costume had a uh, a built-in hydration pack as well as did my own and the other uh, the other costumes that I designed for for Wasteland Weekend last year. Um, just make things practical. And also, because I've been doing so much LARP for years, I mean, far too many years. <laughs> More than 30? Is that actually way beyond your, your actual kind of yeah. official so anniversary? My first was in 1982. Oh, wow. There you go. So it, it's That is a while. Quite <laughs> a few years. But you end up wearing these costumes for an entire weekend and having to be very active in them and run around in them get hit by people who are far more capable than you are. And then you have adrenaline, you know, like anything pretty much can happen. So it's good to think ahead, as you say. And I think that's also one of of the characteristics that, that you are known for, pretty much that the costume is so thought through, that it's not only the 
the visual <laughs> side of it, the materials, but especially as you just said, the practicality, the safety of it, and thinking about kind of the other side. Okay, if it's for a model, for a photo shoot, it's it's something different because then again, you spend just a couple of hours on a on a on a shoot location, even if it's a whole day, you kind of don't have to worry about you know moving and being comfortable and breathing and not being heat stroked and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so you kind of limit the um the options of any kind of you know risk uh health issue you know limbs being chopped off and you know having scars and stuff so, which is very rock and roll but then again why hurt yourself on purpose right yeah, well but my my sort of larp background just has given me um a lasting fear or reaction to anything with like big spikes on it you know, so. <laughs> Helmet with like, loads of nails sticking out. Of it. I just yeah, go, yeah, yeah. oh, that's oh, that's gonna hurt. Good, or you know, you've got loads of screws sticking out of a shoulder. You go, you're gonna be in a bar. You know, <laughs> what you need to do is well, you're screw take... the bar. Hanging by a bar is easy after a show, but oh, to be honest, this I've tried, you know, and it was my fault. Kind of because you know when you're in the heat of the moment on stage, and I was doing one of one of the shows with a very, as you said, spiky kind of gear, you know, big shoulders, and actually funny enough because the, the arm cast was done by a, I think it was a, a potato squisher from World War One, one, one of these metal ones that open. You literally put in it. Yeah, it was a kitchen appliance, you know, and it was supposed to just stay on my hand. And of course, as you are into the show, everything warms up, every, everything st stretches, and it was on, a, on an elastic kind of band. So that kind of connected to the heat and my sweat, expanded, turned around, and in my shows, I fall to the ground, tug and roll, very much so, even from jumping up and whatever. So my mistake was, in the heat of the moment, on adrenaline, I landed on it and I rolled through it, which, well, okay. kids, is not an ideal situation not a very good idea i did not feel that at a time but you know what two days after i look at my arm and i have this massive black bruise i swear to god i thought i would lose my bicep because that's oh. how smashed it was and funny enough like your wife being in the medical profession actually if we can mention that mm -hmm. which we super appreciate because in this weird fucked up time of you know home lockdown she is in the in the forefront of all of this sure. for those that don't know guys i actually do have a medical profession myself and on a physio standpoint but bruising your muscles so massively can actually lead to necrosis you know so much blood build up like the tissue gets rotten so to be honest it was a, it was a fuck me moment you know and that and that at that point i did observe that for a couple of days and it, you know it's just these things happen even being 20 years in the business for example and being a professional as i am is it's just heat of the moment couple of seconds wah, something went wrong like, you know but it, exactly as you say if, if you can kind of put these elements of, of protection and looking forward what could happen if i think okay high temperature um it's going to be on stage there will be lighting there will be pyrotechnics would it melt you know you consider all of these elements and i think that that's what also makes you a professional on that high scale that if, if it is high maintenance as Wasteland Weekend, for example, as an event, you do put all of these elements together. Um, that's what I, at least what I think. It's one woman's opinion, either way. <laughs> I mean, this doesn't mean to say that things still don't go wrong. I mean, of course. It's post -apple. You know, Come on. It's like... You can stress test a rivet or a fixing or a piece and it's fine in the workshop, but when it gets out there and it's on- It has a life of its own. And you know, things, rivets pop, and things aren't as strong as you hoped they would be. So th these things still do happen. It's not like it never happens to me. But it, you of know, course. It does happen. But you're just trying to plan ahead, trying to mm. just consider those things. And also if, if you've, I mean, because I've done a lot of TV work, and you're making props which have to be used by very expensive actors. Uh, since you mention, <laughs> um, well, say, since you mentioned TV, you know you have worked um, substantially throughout the years. I think it was around two thousand five, two thousand seven uh, on Doctor Who. Actually, yeah, it's quite a while ago now. It's when, it was quite a while ago. <laughs> yeah, um, it was the Christopher Eccleston and early David Tennant uh, series that I um, ended up running 
the props fabrication department there. So that was fun because I had Fantastic. grown up. You know, I was a kid who grew up in the 60s and 70s. Doctor Who was a big part of my childhood life in Britain. Because I can it, imagine. I wasn't raised on it, but also it was a part of you know my hobby British. lifestyle. Watching it later on on you know rebroadcast, if you will, like TV was putting that on. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up on that. And then I was working in the industry in Cardiff, you know, working in the TV film industry. And these rumors started to circulate that Doctor Who was coming back. I went, really? Really? <laughs> A few phone calls and asking around, going like, who's doing this? And who's going to be on the art department? And who do I need to contact? And then it was like, this is definitely happening. I thought, sod it this isn't going to happen without me on board so was literally that was my mindset so i am going to be on this production um so i just pestered and bullied and you know made lots of inquiries uh, started to get a few little jobs Been on the phone yeah 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 absolutely um so you know made a few props and then a few more props and then got a phone call said do you want to run this department i went yep okay sure um, <laughs> Where do I sign up? <laughs> so no, it's good. I enjoyed it. It was it was fun. It was hard work. But... Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of these things. Exactly. If even if you're very long in your own profession, in your own business, yet you're freelance, the moment you kind of enter an establishment like that, and the well, everything connected to a to a Doctor Who production uh, on any level is is pretty much no one realizes how much staff is on that and how much responsibility is in each department. And as you say, all of a sudden being um, in the department itself and running it, it's, it's a completely different story. It's different organization. It's like you work under people and you know it, it has different elements to it to kind of um, get that final product out there uh, to the people, as you say, and uh, especially to highly paid actors. It's, it's, it's a different level of work, most definitely. Um, there's a structure and a hierarchy, uh, and I, I think I, I think, in all fairness, everybody was just trying to play catch up on the production because suddenly all these individual people were working on something which is like it's Doctor Who. And I don't know, I don't know how much they how much they really thought. How, how much it meant to a lot of people there. I'm sure a lot of the production it was just another job. But there were de definitely people in the art department for who it was something really special. Um, I know it was really special for me because it was something so, that I'd grown up with. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to work on a production like that was, yeah, that was something special. And I know there are other people in the art department, uh, concept designers, concept artists, um, for for them, it was, this is something really special. Mm. Well, it's one of these bucket list moments, you know, that all of a sudden it's just like being a kid watching shows and you you dream to be on the other side or just rocking out on your couch, you know, thinking that you're, you're poster on the wall, stuff like that. So I think it's, it's the best kind of moment and translation that verifies not only your worth, but but kind of all of a sudden you are a part of that, and it's not weird. It's just a natural like level of growth, and I think that that's really awesome. It's just you know, I consider myself a dreamer, and it's it always has been kind of like that. So it's like it's one of these things exactly that I do remember still my determination as a kid because I started very early on in the business. I was raised on all kinds of inspirations, but I was determined what I wanted to do, you know, and it's, and it's one of these things. It's like when you, when you get one of those projects, especially like Dr. Who, I don't even think that it was so, um, well, so realized at the time how much legacy has grown over that throughout the years, like since airing, you know, since the production. I think now generations like you or me or younger kids are rediscovering it, hopefully, um, mm -hmm. or Alien or anything else, or Eddie, the character that I want to slowly introduce over here. Of course, I had to best for last. <laughs> um, I think the legacy will will sustain, and, it, and it's one of these elements that that have made an imprint in in the world, in in movies, in even festivals. Because, like, you meet all kinds of artists in in Wasteland Weekend, for example, or or anywhere that you pretty much travel. 
uh, travel to. And you do see, okay, these guys are, let's say, hooked on the military aspect of it, but these guys are very much driven by, by movies and aesthetic that literally, you know, they watch, they try to craft themselves or they collaborate with all kinds of makers because that's kind of what, what they love, you know, that's their aesthetic and they, they, remember, hey, that was the guy that was also working on that, in that team. So I find it very, very cool. So I, I so congratulate you on that, <laughs> on Arrogant. Definitely something I, I, I'm proud of having on my CV is, mm. yeah, that, that was that was a moment to go, yeah, I was just tick. That. You don't have to scrape that off the biography, like, like no, let's, no. Not, let's not write about it maybe. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've left a lot of the the TV and film industry behind uh, now because it's really hard work, and you kind of have to live in the city where it's all happening. Or if it's, you it's don't, a bubble, it's, yeah, it's most definitely a specific bubble, right? Months at a time, and I, you know, after I've been doing it for however long it was at the time, twenty, twenty five, thirty years, whatever, I've been yeah. in the business. It's like I'm married now. I kind of I've done a lot of city. We'd like to move out to the countryside. So in that process of moving out to the countryside, you're moving away from that production hub, and the the industry's got a very short, very short term memory. So if you're not there for the last production, you're probably not going to be there for the next production mm. because you're not on the list anymore. And for a while, I was like, mm. but in the end, I went. No, actually, I'm fine with that because I'm yeah. making stuff I want to make now rather than being passed designs down from the art department, here, make this or this or this. Rather, it's me going, do you know what I want to make? I want to make yeah. this. And I, I'm enjoying that process now. So I think I'm quite happy. And also enjoying the process i think first and foremost right because there is not not necessarily much time constraints you know when when you work within a huge facility let's say in an organization it's nothing but kind of delivering stuff at hand but if you have a liberty to kind of work on your own your own well flag if you will there is more freedom i would imagine it would be nice if it worked like that but <laughs> okay <laughs> Production is a production line, literally. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Everything has to hit deadlines, and those deadlines are constantly been shifted due to various other issues within the production, whether it's a, a venue or the weather or an actor not being available or whatever. So your your deadlines are constantly shifting in that. But there is still, I say, this is my full time job. So yeah, there are no plan B. <laughs> I have to quote for a job based on how long I think it's going to take me to make and how much the materials will cost me and then build in my profit margin. And much as it's lovely to be able to go, oh, I'm just going to spend the next two weeks making this <laughs> coat or whatever. <laughs> if, if I do that, then I'll end up working for like, I don't know, 20 quid a day. Um if you well, do the math right, yeah, something yeah. like that probably. <laughs> so, so it would, much as it would be lovely to say there are no time constraints left, actually, yeah, there are if you're trying to do There it always well. are. Yeah. There always are. It, it doesn't matter freelance or not. Yeah. So the, the only time you get the freedom where time isn't an issue, time or budget, is when you're making those things for yourself. And like my full, my full post-apocalyptic costume now has – has taken years to evolve and I, I wouldn't even guess how many hours I've spent making it. And I've had people, many people go like, oh, how, how much for that costume? I go, really, I have no idea because it's just, I've just spent all the time I needed on it over the years in between my commission jobs. Yeah. And that's it's where, really hard to monetize in the sense of... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's impossible. I've got, how much does it cost you? I don't know, £10,000? If you put in all the hours that I've spent on it, I have no idea. Let, let's leave that as a, as a ground zero, like to, to start with, let's say, because as I, as I say, like your style is, number one, substantial. 
but also, as you say, the amount of hours and the development throughout years, not weeks or just like hours, you know, in the middle of the night is just, it's so hard to name and define. That's also why I want, like these things are one of a kind many times and many times not to be sold ever because it's hard to price them, number one. Number two, you know the backstory to them. And then again, some of them I would imagine are like your babies and are really close to your heart. And you mm. cannot imagine, you know, living without maybe one or two from your workshop. Um, but, um, you know, <laughs> some of them are just like in a gallery to say, you know. <laughs> there, there are pieces which I would never part with. Um, I don't think I'd ever part with my post-apocalyptic costume or this one mm. because they're kind of personal. Um, there's there's my goblin pirate puppet that is kind of my my avatar online. If you go on my website, he's the big bold picture there. Yeah. I made him years ago, but I could never sell him because he's a very personal project. However, yeah. I think I've got over that over the years. I've got over that whole thing of like I I don't want to let this go now, which I used to be. Like. <laughs> You're precious. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so much time making this. Do I have to hand it over now because I want to keep it? I've got past that years ago. But, yeah, there are personal projects. I'm waving my hands around a lot, don't I? Put them down on no, my... I love it. It's a physical show. It's a rock dance theater show. So it, it fits perfectly, you know. It's like if you want to strangle someone through the camera, you can do just that too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but f funny enough, I, I could not agree more and kind of understand, like, your standpoint as well. Um, cause for me, I always knew that I have to be kind of my own boss. You know, I was never meant and wired to like work under somebody's artistic direction, the sense of kind of delivering, uh, you know, and especially what, as, as a performer, as a, let's say creator, artistic director, choreographer, it's different. But yet again, if you are in an institution and, and I highly respect those makers, but I know I cannot be one of them. It's like create now. It's mm. just, it does not work like that, you know? And it's so impulsive. And of course, as you say, some things that yeah. you do have, let's say, planned that is more commercial, if you will, it's just a name, um, not necessarily, but like with you, we understand that through commissioned work, with the other projects that you kind of keep to yourself and spend however much time on that, that's your freelance work. And that's exactly, you do with it as you will. You can, you can sell it, you can showcase it, you can have that in a performance or a music video. But yeah, the work is so completely different on, on any level. So um, it is quite interesting, like the opposites and well, pluses and minuses of, of both worlds, I would imagine either way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. How, how do you explain being an artist? And um, I don't do think we're even gonna try. You know what? Funny enough, I don't call myself one. It's it's not for me to judge. To be honest, it's just kind of what I do. You know, you do stuff. Yeah. I do stuff. I do stuff as well. It just makes me happy. It's the way to communicate with the world. Stuff and I think. <laughs> think <laughs> it's funny because I was talking to a to a friend of mine, to a bass player actually, and we did. Catch, catch that notion that, you know what, we're just communicators and that's one platform, you know, just to get that out from here, from the head, from the heart, from the gut, wherever it comes from, which is actually quite funny. I don't know where it comes from you. Do you wake up with a ready idea and concept and you just kind of translate that or, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, people, that's the classic question, isn't it, for an artist, where do you get your ideas from? Um, and yeah, you're going to get <laughs> from other people's work. You'll see things on, on movies or series or that other crafters have done. You go, oh, that's really nice. Or idea. you just drink coffee sometimes and it just hits you, right? You or never know. You just go on a massive caffeine rush until your brain explodes with ideas, yes. And then collapse. <laughs> Guys, there's there's no mysticism to post up or you just are so dosed up on caffeine that it all just comes by itself. <laughs> there you go, the mystery solved, the Rock Dance Theater exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I do. I just That's live. all it is. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, uh, where do you get your ideas from? Um, I mean, everywhere. I mean, everywhere. You see, you go beach combing or something. Ah, oh, beaches. I remember those. They were great when we were allowed outdoors. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the whole idea that I got of just walking down the beach and going, oh, there's a bit of drift there. That'd be interesting making some, some piece of kit that looked as though it had been made out of beach yeah, 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 yeah. You um, know, it's funny, I did that as a kid, you know, collecting yeah. stones and sticks and shells and all kinds of stuff. You just kind of put that together, right? It was creative and uh, yeah. all of a sudden it turned into a form of any yeah. sort. 
Uh, or, or you'll see a shape. The, for me, a, a lot of it is about finding shapes. I think I've said this before. But, yeah, seeing a shape and being inspired by a shape or a combination of shapes. Um, because we had to do a lot of that, going, just briefly going back to Doctor Who, we had to do a lot of that in the prop making that we did for Doctor Who because the budget was just that. Well, the budget for my department was that. Mm. Um, we just literally didn't have the facilities in terms of tools, in terms of equipment, in terms of time or you know finances to make a lot of things from scratch. So I very much developed this this eye for seeing shapes and interpreting shapes and putting shapes together, which would then cover the brief of, of what you know, the script required. What, what was needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about metamorphosis of the shape? Because like, that's also one of my favorite kind of topics that I bounce off other people, other creators, you know, because it's a huge part of my work, actually. Metaphor, metamorphosis, period. Like the whole process of transforming you know you start off somewhere and then you know for me, I, I think i think we're talking about the same thing but for me i say it's the the evolution or of, evolution yeah it could be that yeah. too yeah. but it's just the same thing we're, we're, we're just calling it different things but yeah the the evolution the metamorphosis of a piece i think is that's a real crucial part of of my design process i very rarely will have a hard and fast concrete drawing which I have to follow. Yeah. When I start a piece, I'll have an idea. I'll, I'll have some rough sketches, maybe. Rough sketch, exactly. Which, and if, then if it's for a client, especially that you know that they'll want some vague idea of where the hell I'm going if they're going to give me money. <laughs> it's a uh, little bit trial and error, you know. Maybe this, maybe this. More, more zombie, more alien, yeah. more whatever. So. Uh. But th there will still always be that a, a big element of the build will be as I start building it, the, the costume, the design, the prop will evolve and become something bigger. Um, mm. It will not be exactly the way it started off or not be exactly how I imagined it. But in the end, I've played around with shapes. I've played around with textures and just tried things on the workbench. And I'll end up with something. So there, there's your metamorphosis. There's your evolution is that that happens a lot on the workbench and it's a major part of, of how I design things. That's um, awesome. I think it's that freedom from the TV film industry where here's your design, right <laughs> at the start, make that. I, th I find that restricting now and I don't like working like that. If, if you're Well, I, any kind of restriction kind of limits you down there at an early process and also with the final product whatever that might be show record design you know mask you name it so like kind of limitation freaks me out i like it at the same time because coming back to costumes let's say limitation in my mind also creates a lot of uh opportunities kind of especially on stage i'm a hypocrite just now saying that i don't like limitations yet i dig it it's weird but what i mean by that is actually when i do put on a costume that is restraining that is hard to work with because let's say it's heavy i have boots that that are spiked with all kinds of screws you know there is paint involved there is something that is literally squeezing my calf and it's like at at one point of course it's a pain in the butt Mm -hmm. on a physiological level but at the same time that's exactly where the ideas come from you know like i put on a weird piece of gear and just like the movement the stage language falls out of it it's okay. i construct it on that and that's the the process that i actually love you know so yeah. for me also what i wanted to ask you about do you think that let's say someone performing in your costume or wearing it do you feel that enhances the metamorphosis that it kind of gets another life of its own while it's being worn, let's say, by a living human being? <sighs> I mean, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, there are there are limitations on on everything. If you had a like the old brief of just do whatever the hell you want, I, th I think that would be that <laughs> freedom for all. <laughs> Automatic. If you've got a brief, if you've got a, if you've got limitations, there, there's you know, there's a boundary to how far you can go with something. Then those challenges get you approaching 
problem solving in interesting ways. If if there are no problems to solve, if there are no boundaries, if there are no limitations, then I don't think you have that challenge. And I, I think that creative challenge comes a lot from, okay, it must do this. It has to do mm. this. It has to allow the I web. think it. This. It's more guidelines, maybe. Maybe that's the better word to describe that. Like, you get guidelines, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's people, super interesting. I mean, when, when people come to me, they want some, they've got a vague idea. Yeah, okay. yeah, and usually it's you, the guy, that has to translate that into a material <laughs> object. I enjoy that. I, I, I would much rather a client comes to me with a vague idea or a general outline and just go, hey, you know, I trust you. Yeah. Can you interpret this? Come up with an idea within within these confines. That's great. I, I'm more than happy to do that. It's it's when a client will come to you with absolutely no idea, and then, <laughs> and you, then have, you have to deliver. No, you, no, then you have to try and pin them down to something. You have to try and find out. Okay, well, what is it that you're after? What? That, give me some clues. Quite often, I'll just say, well, if, if, you, something. <laughs> if you come to me and you like my work, then send me some photographs off my off my website. Mm. To tell me what you like about my work, what elements you like, and then maybe we can put those together. But you, you'd need you do need those boundaries and say if 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 there are none, then I think you got even more work to try and find those boundaries to work within. Yeah, yeah. I think we're totally t talking about the same thing. For me, it's more guidelines, really, or like pinpoints or um, riffs, if you will. It's funny because a riff or a hook is is something out of the music world, let's, let's say like a piece of sound or whatever, something where it starts from and all of a sudden, boom, it's a whole song. Mm -hmm. For me, those limitations or guidelines, if, if we decide on a common notion, it, either way, it's just words. I think it's exactly that, as you say, that, it's, that it brings it closer to, to number one, the starting point, the sketch, if you will, then the whole production of it, the process of evaluation, what elements you actually add. Is that a mold? Is that just a blend? You pick the materials and so on. And that exactly the final product, if you will, um, that it is a costume, it is a character. And speaking of characters, I think you, Mark, have done a performance in your life that is quite historical, I would say. And um, in, 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 any, in any words, <laughs> and what I mean by that, you actually, you know, performance. Say again. Do you, do you mean I personally have done a performance that's historic? Or oh yeah. With one. Shit, what's that? <laughs> well, funny enough, you you might interpret that completely different. But for me, it's it's one of these amazing stories. Not only in the performance world, audition world. Uh, I mean. You having the super cool story, which I personally do love. Uh, I did take it off the website, and I do want to mention that for for all of our viewers, your collaboration with Iron Maiden, because right. I think the way you arrived for the actual meeting, you know, I'm gonna let you tell the story. I don't want to give it away because it's a super cool story, and I really love it. But uh, that that for me was like, man, he took it to an, to a next level, and you know. Call me crazy. I think that's one of the elements why, while you you sealed the deal. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess it, it, it worked. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll try and do a potted recap of the story. All it was right. cool. I'll, just, I'll just do the intro for, for our viewers. Mark Give me the drum roll. has been involved. Well, no, I'm the drummer based. Like, we're all improvising over here. No, but for all of you guys that, that are more let's say music followers, or of course, know the very famous band Iron Maiden. Back in the day, it was 1991, 92. Um, Iron Maiden has been actually under Sanctuary Records. Uh, and at that point, they were doing a new project, a new record. They needed a new image to kind of put them out there in a historical standpoint. And where Mark comes in, this is exactly where you fill in your part of the story. Like one day you wake up and you get a call. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Uh, of start off moment. My part of the story starts about a year earlier yeah. because I was working for a company in Cardiff, which was doing a lot of TV and film production, props making and stuff. One day, two guys that we'd never seen turned up 
in the workshop said, uh, we're interested in getting into uh, video music production, yeah, music videos. Uh, we've found out about your company. Um, I was working for a, a friend and mentor of mine, uh, Bill Talbot, who sadly passed away last year. A uh, very talented bloke. But I was working for him. These guys turned up, said, we want to get into music videos. Uh, do you want to help us? And we Play? Said, yeah, well, yeah, okay. So well, we're going to get some interviews. You know, we're, going, we're going to get some meetings with like Kate Bush and Iron Maiden and, and Peter Gabriel and stuff. Peter right? Gabriel, yeah, that was the triad, the holy back yeah. in the day. Yeah, absolutely. So I so said, fine, okay, uh, we'll do something if you can get some interviews. So they got some interviews and said, so, well, we've got a meeting with Sanctuary Records in London, Iron Maidens. Uh, group. So, uh, we, we can you do something? Come along to the meeting and do something. Oh, okay. So, I stupidly volunteered to dress up as a zombie and fall prosthesis and ended up in it for 10 hours. Uh, and we, I think it was a little bit more what I read from your blog. <laughs> it's all a blur now. It's all a big latex and sweaty blur. So <laughs> uh, they, they went, okay, we've got a meeting in the afternoon in London. Uh, <laughs> First of all, we want to go and see Peter Gabriel's studios. So I'm, okay, fine. Obviously. I was sat in the back of the car. They pulled up outside Box Studios in, in Bath, which was Peter Gabriel's studios at the time. And uh, so we're just, we just we haven't got a meeting, but we're just going to see if he's in. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we did that. And I was sat in the back of the car with big Alsatians staring through the gate, guard dogs on the other side going, he looks tasty. And I was going, oh, why am I doing this? And I don't know if he wasn't in, or if he was, he told him to back off, no way. Look at that freak in the back of the car there. So we went down to London, parked, went to a pub. I was still in prosthesis. <laughs> Full prosthesis. I know. I just, um, th they were in their business suits, and I'm there dressed as a zombie. I mean, yeah, fair news, I didn't get beaten to death with the cricket back when we walked into the pub. Um, and we turned up at Sanctuary Records, and... As I say, um, the people at Sanctuary Records must have seen some shit in their time because they barely backed me <laughs> when I walked in. And we got a meeting, sat down. With these two guys did all, all their talking, and I just sat there. Uh, and at the end, the, the only comment I got was, nice makeup. Oh, thank you very much. Got outside, and I was just tearing all this stuff off. <laughs> now they liked it. Okay, time to go. <laughs> And then nothing happened for a year. We didn't hear a thing for a year. And then we, the studio one day got a phone call uh, from Sanctuary Records going, Iron Maiden, they're looking for an Eddie. Uh, would you like to design and make the Eddie for the next album? Exactly. So at that point, they... That's how it was born. Yeah. And they didn't have any real hard and fast design at that point. So I did loads of different sketches and concepts and eventually ended up talking to to Bruce Dickinson uh, on the phone who was you know by that point he'd started with his wife to get a, a proper concrete idea of what they wanted and that's how we ended up with this sort of bat-winged Eddie figure that ended up on various parts of the promotional uh, casing for Fear of the Dark. Yeah one of my favorite albums actually by Iron Maiden. Mm. No, it's, yeah. it's good. I mean, I, I can't say I can uh, name the entire back catalogue of Iron Maiden, but man. Yeah, no worries. It's not about that. But it, it, funny enough, because as you as you mentioned, Bruce Dickinson, I think he was also inspired by, um, you, you probably saw that more than twice. I remember being actually raised on that because it, it was on uh, VHS tape still, the, the part of Disney's Fantasia. Um, yeah, exactly what he was night night on the bald mountain right that exact kind of bit and it's funny because i remember watching that as a kid living over in california and of course me being a weird kid i gotta mention that i so was digging those characters you know and then that kind of genre of mystique and like i was like what is this i don't know what it is but i like it and i swear to god i was three or four years old and i told my mom specifically you know what this is boring i don't like princesses and like pony horses whatever because I was literally like dozing off. I was like falling asleep. But when the parts with the monsters came on, I was like, ooh, I like this. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. I, it's funny that it, that was also his kind of... Get the demons out. Come on. <laughs>
That's awesome. Well, I think it, it's not only one of those historical moments in music because anyone that doesn't even know the music, they know Eddie. They they know the character. They they pick up a shirt with the print on. They don't know what that is. They discover that maybe later on, but it's an iconic character that you've created. And Hale, mm -hmm. I'm so proud to to kind of Oh, well, okay, I'll bring that up too. I created Eddie because I'm pretty certain that Eddie had been an established character on previous yeah. albums. Uh, he just has a different look on each album. It was but, a version oh, of. It was a version yeah. of. But it was a version of, and he's you've got the the eye socket shape, which is kind of a the classic Eddie. And yeah. But I definitely didn't. Don't give me the credit for creating Eddie. I just. <laughs> and was involved in making one eddy and i was quite pleased with him um and apparently there's a, a real big iron maiden fan i think in south america has got the head from that How do they from that skull so somebody sent me a photograph of this this head enshrined on a velvet cushion <laughs> yeah, 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 and the casing, yeah, that's awesome, yeah. like a shrine moment. <laughs> well, I think, like, what I meant by that is actually, of course, not, not inventing the whole throughout the years image of Eddie, but I think especially for, for the album Fear of the Dark, that's one of their most renowned albums that, that people are so familiar with, as I say, not, not actually knowing much about it, you know, not knowing the music, but it does pop up, and it's out there, you know, in the... In pop culture, it's it's out there in the music scene, like you name it. So it has been recreated and re reprinted, if you will, multiple yeah. times. I've, I've had people send me photographs of their back tattoo with my Eddie on it, like a there full go. tattoo. It would go, oh, that's really cool. As far as flattery goes, yeah, why not? Like Eddie for life, back over there. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm, he's he's kicked he's kicked around for yeah. a few years now. But yeah, it was just one of one of those jobs. You just go, wow, this is pretty cool. I'm working for Iron Maiden. Yeah. So I got I got to meet the band very briefly when they came to do their, their sort of photo shoot, uh, which we'd set up. So I got you know, briefly got to meet the band and you go, boy. Uh, <laughs> at that point I had like long hair and I was, you know, some patched jeans and stuff. So I kind yeah. of looked more appropriate back then than I do now in terms of rock <laughs> But there yeah. you go. Yeah. No, but what for for me, it's always one of these moments that you take it to the extreme, exactly like dressing up in full prosthetics. Like I love that stuff. You know that probably if I were you, like modestly said, I would do the same thing. It's just like if you do it, just do it right. You know, and then sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. As you say in your case, you got the call like within a year. Sometimes you wait longer. Sometimes you never get it. But it, it's cool when that happens, most definitely. So. Right. Um, if you throw enough stuff at, stuff at the wall, some of it will stick. Um, <laughs> right. one... Speaking of materials thrown around, um, what are your favorite materials to play around with right now? Um, um, is well, it natural? Is it like fiberglass, latex? Well, maybe latex you're fed up with right now. <laughs> Loathe and detest fiberglass in all of its forms and try and avoid it wherever possible. It's a nasty material. Right. Latex, I'm, I have used gallons and gallons and gallons of latex over my life. Uh, it's stinky, but it's very, very versatile. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's latex mask. Which, uh -huh. uh, I think one of your latest designs, guys, that we can actually see on, on Mark's social media, like from a couple of days or... Yeah, a week or so ago. It's, it's <laughs> Surprise! Really, oh, it's left, right. I need a reverse scan monitor. It's like I know, yeah. Like I cannot get used to it either way. Um, Thank God for two sides. I use a lot of, but less so in the post-apocalyptic work that I'm doing. It's, it's mostly it's plastics, leathers, fabrics, canvases. Um, I don't use a lot of. I don't use a lot of, I was going to say, real materials. I don't use a lot of metal and stuff. I mean, yeah. I've, I've kind of always described prop making for like TV and film as being um, the process of lying in 3D because you're always trying to make a material look like something else. Yeah. You know, whether it's foam and silicon and meant to Quite be frankly, there's a lot of limit, uh, imitation, I'm sorry, within it. It's like that's what 
whole Hollywood is known for, actually, as as you say, like doing something that weighs, you know, it's like air almost, and it looks like a rock, you know, within an avalanche or something. So yeah, it's exactly absolutely. that. It is yeah. you're making one material convincingly look like something completely different, generally with a lot more weight to it. So, I mean, a, a lot of plastics that I use, so that helmet there, um, it's mostly plastic, but paint processes and finishes hopefully give you the impression that... Of the actual rust, let's say. Yeah. yeah. So th in terms of materials, yeah, it's kind of that. It's stuff. That's made <laughs> It's always stuff <laughs> if it comes down to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you did you notice that you started looking at objects differently the longer you're in your own work field? I don't want to go too much into details because I think most definitely like the crafts and your own kind of skills should should stay a trade secret. Like I personally have always been like that, you know, and it's not about copywriting just stuff out of default. It's just purely you know, it's it's original and it should be associated to the person that kind of invented it. But would you say that you you look at I don't know recycled materials differently right now just because you do you know post apple work and you modify the function of it? And um... I think probably that started when I was working on Doctor Who that mm -hmm. I was basically forced into the position of having to look for shapes. And I would go around DIY right. shops looking for shapes which echoed the designs that had been sent to us from mm. you know, up in the art department. So that trained my my eye and my mind to start looking at those shapes. And that is kind of what works so nicely for the post-apocalyptic stuff, is that, that that whole process of, well, salvaged. Is, <laughs> exactly. chose, well, this is why I chose the name, because you were salvaging... Shameless plug, by the way. Purposes. Guys, get the t-shirt. Oh, sorry. T-Public. T-Public. Shameless plug, but that's why we're here for as well. <laughs> Carry on. But yeah, that, that whole process of taking things and repurposing them, putting them together in different ways, that's... Now I've completely lost track of where I was going. But no, it's perfect. Don't worry. Okay. It's, it's, it's exactly that, you know? I just wanted to kind of reconfirm because... Me as a performer, I'm exactly the same. I love changing the the idea of an object that is supposed to do something completely different. You know, I would take a belt that would be normally a, a waist belt and I would do something around my wrist or my head, whatever. It's like it's small format, yet like changing the function of an object I find so cool as a creative level. It's just, you know, why not put a shoe on your on your hand all of a sudden? I've done that multiple times in my shows. But I got to... I was going to say, it's fun as well. It's fun being able to spot totally. those things. I mean, there are some glorious crafters, especially in the post-apocalyptic genre, some, some really brilliant crafters out there. And it's always fun just, you see their work on Instagram. Yeah, or, what what are they doing? Like, I, I would never really think of that, yeah. recognize that. <laughs> and I, I like that process of discovery of going, or, or, you know, showing it off in your own stuff. Oh, what's that? Oh, well, actually, that's just the nozzle from a garden hose. Or, you know, these yeah, yeah. Are canisters for an asthma and a halo. Like, no one has to know, you know? That's kind yeah. of the thing. It's like, it is what it is at the very end, and people are, like, really curious. Like, what the yeah. fuck is that, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's maybe it's not so... It's not so weird on costumes for that you're making for people, sort of, for personal use. But if, yeah. if using found items or recognizable items for things like TV productions or films and that whole process That's of different. scratch building, yeah, of kit bashing uh, is the term they use. Is the term. Taking, taking things and going, oh, I'm going to put that in and put that on the back of the set. And there are so many, there are so many examples of that. Major Hollywood films are like, well, if you look in the back of that screen, there's a Phillips Lady Shavers, you know, <laughs> using as a communicator. And For we do a lot on Doctor Who as well. Uh, that there are, there's the interior of a Dyson vacuum cleaner for a space gun, <laughs> or this. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun, and it gives. It, you know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people out there going, "Oh, that shit!" Oh, you know, it's it's not it's mystical not at all. That you ruined it. 
<laughs> but it's awful. I mean, I don't have a 3D printer. I, mean, I don't have the facility to create unique shapes. But I do have a good eye for seeing other shapes and putting them together in interesting ways. Mm. So, you know, what? It, it's funny with perception, like generally, if because, uh, for example, when I when I started to work a little bit hard, more hardcore with, let's say, really post Apple designers on the level of, you know, as, as it's best, um, like with Cult of Chrome, for example, it was mm -hmm. funny because I could never look at trash in the same way as I did before as like a bottle cap. I see totally differently these days and I don't drink alcohol by the way, but it's like when I see them and all kinds of stuff, I go like, fuck, you know, I, I see elements of costumes. It's ridiculous. I swear to God. So you're already, your mindsets, you know, changes yeah. so much, but you know, that that's the fun of it. I think. That's, that's why this genre is so good at that because you were working within within a genre where that would be a natural thing. Civilization has collapsed. In, <laughs> everything's just like you know, left lying around. A bomb exploded. What do you do with that? How would that be? Yeah. Those together. So, you know, salvaging things from, from leftovers, things that have been thrown away. And that's why this genre is, I really enjoy working in this genre. And it, it makes up 90% of my work now. Yeah. It just fits the way I work, and I think the way I work fits it. So I, th I think we sort of meshed. I think it's a natural marriage, full on. Yeah, and at the same time, you know, you do you do good things for the planet. You know, every now and then cleaning up some of the shit that we're just like piled with. Oh, yeah. Don't get me even started. Small percentage yet, yeah. you know. I mean, my my industry, the the TV and film industry, is responsible for so much landfill. I mean, you, you know what? Person. Every industry, probably. So I'm, I'm just doing this little, little bit. I've just got to go, oh, we'll save that from the landfill. And I'll <laughs> yeah, small contribution, yet so we'll, important. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, you know what, Mark? I get, generally, I could talk to you for hours, but... Since we don't have the liberty, I don't want to occupy too much of your time, number one, and I want to leave some, well, un untapped territory for hopefully uh, later episodes. But I want to shoot a couple of fast ones. If you had to choose um, between tea and coffee, what's your drink right now to go to? Uh, at the moment, coffee is keeping me going. Alrighty, Awesome. Same for me. What's your weird inspiration? <laughs> Weird inspiration. I think the last ninety minutes we pretty much covered that, but probably have it would it would be that ugly doll for sale at a car boot sale. <laughs> you never know. Maybe it's an ugly guitar tuner. You know, <laughs> chuck one in the post to me, and I'll make it into something for you. I will, most def. Just you wait. <laughs> Shipped within a month. Um, yeah. What's what's your go to uh, track right now on Spotify? If you use any digital outlets, like playing it. <laughs> what do I play? Well, I mean, I, I play quite a bit in the workshop. I work alone, so I, you know, I've got to have something on in the background. Um, what would I use? I've been listening to a fair bit of Rush at the moment. Um, All right. Sort of a bit of a back catalogue of, of Led Zepp as well. I mean, my, a lot of my music tastes are from the 70s because that's when I was a teenager. And that's when a lot of my formative stuff. But you know, I'll chuck in a bit of a bit of Future Sound of London if I want a bit more of an up tempo. Um, occasionally a bit of V two A chucked in there as well. It's mm. kind of eclectic, so I couldn't give you one track. But if I had to, it's hard. I know that's why I do it. Rush Tom Sawyer. Okay, there's there's a good beat, <laughs> a good start. Just rolls along. Yeah, I'll give you that one then. Okay, cool. Fair enough. You know, it's it's a conversation opener, so I gotta leave it at that because I could talk music forever. And of course, we know, or for our viewers that are maybe just checking in right now on our Rock Dance Theater live stream, my special guest is Mark Cordery, and the post-apocalyptic genre work craft has cross-pollinated the music world ever so much in history, as we know. Uh, so that's why it's all intertwined and it's all interactive, and that's why it makes fun. So, yeah. Well, basically, guys, I could I could tell you so much more, and, and also Mark could tell you probably so many stories, but we do have to let you go. I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the show, for hanging out with me, for a coffee today, and uh, yeah, it's just been very, very awesome, and hopefully we do inspire people to check out more stuff. Uh, if you could say 
what's happening with your reality within the next couple of weeks, couple of months? What can all of our viewers look forward to other than hitting, of course, your official website, Mark, um, markcordery.com, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken. We will throw that out again. Um, oh. What's what's cooking? Um, I'm Thankfully, I have still got quite a few commissions coming in. I mean, it, it took a bit of a wobbly when the whole pandemic thing. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say the C word. <laughs> I didn't say it. I said B awesome. word. Just... So when all that kicked off, it went because, you know, fancy dress isn't high on people's priority lists at a time like this. Which is basically it's fancy dress. Um, but it's, it's coming back. I'm getting a lot of masks. Obviously, the the whole meme thing, which was just weird as, uh, that sort of gave me a bit of bit of publicity as well. In intellectual property, guys, uh, a topic for a next episode, Mosef, because that's like that's for hours too. Yeah, there's 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 some weird ideas out on the internet of what you own and what you don't. Anyway, um, so I'm working. I'm making stuff. I've got commissions. Unfortunately, Wasteland Weekend had to be cancelled for this year, um, but it's you know, back again the following year. So I'm still getting commissions in from that, which I always love working on. And yeah, I just I'm taking over. I mean, yeah, I'm on. I one. like that. My quarterly takeover. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what I what I started doing as well. It starts with the mind, and then you just kind of. You're everywhere. Awesome. Well, you know what? You never know. Maybe Rogdan Theater is going to be at Wasteland Weekend too, because I've never been personally. Um, I I would look so much forward to one time. It's just like awesome. It's one of these places. You know, it's like Hellfest, pretty much, or or Wacken. You know, for for music bands, it's, it's one of these places just to be. It, it's yeah. super cool. Yeah, they they've, they've got good bands there. Um, the the place is just. It's a film set. It's a, it's a multi-million dollar movie set. With it's a kid's dream, guys. Like, I, I'm mentally 13 still. I think Mark is maybe a little bit older, maybe 16 around. <laughs> okay, not, not that much older. So, yeah, pretty much. Hopefully, guys, we do see you somewhere out there. And please uh, check out Mark Cordery online. I'm not going to say more. Just, like, hit subscribe, lit, like, follow, all of that good stuff. And uh, I will wrap this up uh, officially, Mark. I will let you go into the green room to, like, kind of decompress and I will show you just in one very second but I want to thank you so much again thank you all of you for tuning in today with us guys it has been a special episode in the wastelands and uh yeah until further notice guys stay safe and uh stay out there and stay post apo thank you so much mark thank you thank you bye all righty guys so yeah basically to be continued as you see um these podcasts have been developing in a more rapid scale than I would even imagine. This is a virtual stage, guys, and I'm very glad and happy that you can join me and also that my fabulous uh, guests can join me in it. And um, today we are wrapping up a post-apocalyptic um, episode. As I said before, this will air within a day and a half, probably next week. Uh, sometimes when we do get through editing, we will throw some very cool images for you so that you can actually figure out and check out what the heck we were talking about during um, some of the beautiful artwork and, and designs of Mark and, uh, you know, all of the good stuff, as I, as I say. So if you have not subscribed yet, click below, throw us a comment, uh, let us know what, uh, what you thought about this episode. And tomorrow, I already want to invite you. That's uh, 11th of May. That's a Monday. And we do have a next episode with a very special um, close uh, friend of mine, close to my heart, Charlotte Overholm, a diva of the Swedish uh, physical dance world. And we're going to talk to her. So that's going to be tomorrow on seven uh, at 7 p.m. Central European time at 1 p.m. EDT. So please, Check that out and yeah, hit the reminder so that you don't freaking miss it, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have been your humble host for today, Anna Himovic from Rock Dance Theater, and our special guest was Mark Cordery himself. Until next time, later. <laughs>